Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lunch and Listen and to being able to meet one of our newest members who hasn't even been able to get to California yet or back to California. Johanna, welcome. Hello. Hi. It's very nice to be here. It's nice to have you as a new member, and you are no stranger to California, that's for sure. I'll no, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I was in Los Angeles for five years while I was studying at the Colburn School. So I lived right there in downtown for four years for my undergraduate and then one year for my postgraduate professional studies. And you, during that time, you played with the Colburn Orchestra, Colburn Orchestra and also a lot of chamber mu music, if your bio is, if I read your bio correctly. Yes. Um, so I think I was involved in almost every single Colburn Orchestra concert because we've got a very, very small amount of players there. So we have just enough to fill an orchestra at most times um, in the student body. So I played a lot with them and yeah, for chamber music, just wherever I could get an opportunity. Um, I really love to play chamber music, um, but my favorite form of chamber music is in a small chamber orchestra because I think there's some really spectacular music written for small chamber ensembles like that. Which of course we're getting to know better and better now in this COVID time when we can't come return to a full orchestra. Um, so when did you audition for the orchestra? Do you remember that day? Yes, I think it was either November 4th or 5th in 2019. Um, I took the train down from Los Angeles and yeah, I, I came in, I played on the first day and I think I had to come back and play a couple more rounds after the weekend. Um, but yes, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to believe that that was back in 2019. It is hard to believe. And we were really ecstatic that day because you were joined by other new colleagues out of that same audition, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, how do you prepare for an audition? You know, you, you, you've got, you've graduated, you've been active playing in playing as substitutes in orchestras, playing chamber music, but, you know, getting that job and, and deciding where to apply and where to travel to. Obviously this was a train ride, so that kind of made it easy as opposed to across the country, but how did you actually prepare for that audition? Well, I think every musician who kind of has it on their radar that they want to be actively auditioning for and preparing for auditions, they kind of have their list of standard excerpts that they're always working on. Um, and I think in this case, for this audition, I had that list of excerpts, you know, you've got your, your 10 that you know are going to be on every audition, right? And so those are the ones that you're working on all year. But you know, every audition is different. And for this audition, I remember I got the list and I think it was a couple months prior, two or three months prior, where I just kind of had to separate all the excerpts on the list because it's, it's a big long one and kind of separate them into lists of which ones am I gonna work on each day? And you know, I kind of had a group of here are all the new excerpts that I've never played before. Here are the ones that I played a hundred times and here are the ones that I played a hundred times but are still really, really hard in the middle and kind of had to separate them into which ones to work on every day. Cause you know, if you work on every single excerpt on the list every day, you're just gonna get really tired out really fast. So I think I remember I had to kind of make, make a day by day list and schedule for myself. So what composers are on that list? What composers, what, you know, what um, parts of, for the viola are particularly noteworthy in terms of audition lists? Uh, well, Strauss, for sure. I think Strauss writes some of the hardest string parts. I mean, it's for every instrument, very, very difficult parts. They're some of the most uh, effective and imaginative writing, um, but very, very difficult. There's a lot of ink on that page. So you, I can always expect to see Strauss um, on an audition list and definitely some Tchaikovsky definitely some Mozart. I always, there's always going to be a lot of contrast of different composers, but I would definitely say, yeah, definitely look out for those three. Those are always the ones that I have to put at the top of my priorities. And of course, Giles is a, is a composer near and dear to the music director's heart, so we'll be certainly hearing a lot of that over the next years. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. It's a lot of fun to play once you know the part. It's just a lot of preparation goes into it. And uh, did, do you have to pre uh, prepare a concerto as well? Yes, I prepared the Bartok Viola Concerto. I think there was a choice you could choose amongst 
uh, three of the most standard viola concertos. Um, so I chose the Bartok because that's what I had been working on that year. And I think also uh, you could make a selection from any of the Bach uh, cello suites adapted for viola. So there was a bit of uh, some virtuosic uh, concerto writing and then some, some Bach as well for the audition. So when you're projecting who you are as a musician into that screen, <laughs> on the other side, of course, are the panelists. You know, what do you want to say about yourself? What, what is it that you think is um, distinctive about your playing? Or, or how are you focused on that? Well, actually, I think I can talk specifically about this audition um, when I played at the hall in San Diego, uh, because I know the moment I walked out there, I mean, I had no idea what to expect. I, I've seen pictures of the hall before, but of course I've never played in there. And, you know, it's not likely that I'll have the opportunity to, you know, play alone in a hall like that again either. So I think what I was thinking when I walked out was just getting to know what kind of sound my instrument was playing in the hall. Um, and I thought of this phrase, I heard it once in a masterclass, and I, I, always, I always think about it when I'm playing in a new space for the first time, which is play chamber music with the hall. And I think that was kind of, you know, what was just going through my head the whole time and kind of just appreciating the sound of the hall and the sounds that my instrument was making and knowing that this was a very unique experience individual to me. Um, and just, just enjoying the sounds of, you know, one lone instrument in such a big hall and yet it still felt very intimate. So I think I actually got, once I got into the, you know, the feeling of how your instrument sounds in the hall, I think it's a lot easier to you know, relax, and then you can start to really um, appreciate the music and, you know, just just play, not worry about the audition part anymore. That's interesting because, of course, you don't have an opportunity to warm up or rehearse on the stage. You pretty much walk out there on that carpet and begin. Mm -hmm. And every every stage is very different. So that's a that's a very interesting approach. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, it was a uh, very nerve wracking experience for sure. But I, I have always found that keeping that mentality um, and yeah, just trying to make the most of, you know, the beautiful sounds that the hall is giving back um, has always helped me a lot to calm down and get control of my nerves as, as best I can, so. There's some questions from people on, what, what are your favorite, what composer of chamber music? What are your favorite composers of chamber music? Hmm. I had to think about that. I don't know if I have a particular favorite composer, but I know I have some pieces that are really, really fun to play with um, in groups with my friends. Um, any Mendelssohn string quartet, there's there's six of them, which are just absolutely incredible. I I adore playing the Mendelssohn quartets. There's not a there's not a bad moment in any of them. So I would definitely put Mendelssohn um, for number one for string quartets in, in my heart. Um, and I have to say that my favorite piece to play with friends, um, whenever I can, I try to, well, before, before uh, everyone was socially distant, uh, one of my favorite things to do would be to get together with my friends and have a reading party where, you know, none of us had ever played in that environment together before. And we just play some chamber music on site. And one of my favorite pieces for that is the Tchaikovsky Souvenir to Florence for six players. And that has to be one of my favorite pieces to play with friends. Sounds wonderful. We have a chamber music series here in when we all get back together of seven or eight concerts. And so hopefully you'll be an active member of our chamber music family. I hope so. Um, I, I noted that you won the Primrose Prize. I was a quarter finalist in the Primrose competition. And how familiar are, are you with Primrose himself? Is he someone you looked up to or knew a lot about? I am not 100% like familiar with his origin story and um, a lot of, I guess a lot of his career, uh, a lot of his career, uh, but I definitely, would listen to his recordings even when I first started playing viola there are some um, old recordings of his that are still out there that I used to listen to a lot um, and actually for that competition I had to prepare a piece that had been transcribed by Primrose um, it was one of the violin concertos and an excerpt of it had been transcribed for viola so I actually listened to Mr. Primrose's recording a lot 
during the time when I was preparing for that. So I always like well, to use him as reference. And who else would you consider influential in your in your viola? Um, life? Well, I I have to say that my one of my greatest inspirations of all time is Paul Coletti. Um, and I had the amazing honor of being able to study with him for five years in California because I mean, before I, before I met him and I got to study with him, I, you know, I just had the recordings of him playing, which are unbelievable. And then to go out there and have the chance to study with him personally and get to know him and play with him side by side. I, I had one performance, which will always stick in my mind where he asked me to play a duo that he had written for two violas. And it was a concert that he had to do last minute. And so he said, oh, you're about to start working on new music here, learn this and play it with me at my concert. And I just, that was, that was probably one of my favorite performances of all time. And so I always, I always look up to Mr. Coletti as probably one of my number one, um, not just viola influences, but musical influences. It's great to have those mentors in our life. Um, when did you choose, or when did you uh, begin playing the viola you play on today? Um, actually, it was a bit of a long journey to start playing viola as I do today. Um, so I started violin when I was five and I did it kind of as a, I, my sisters were very serious about violin. I have an older sister who plays violin. Um, and as a young kid, I kind of just, I, I really wanted to do it too. And, but after a while, once I got to be maybe 11 or 12, it started to kind of feel like an extracurricular thing to me. And I don't, I don't know if I was taking it as seriously yet, but Somehow I ended up being recruited into the viola section of my youth orchestra at the time. My conductor had me play viola. And so I thought, well, I've got to take lessons. You know, I need to, I need to learn how to play this instrument and handle it better. And I kind of was starting to like it too. And I remember I went to my first lesson with uh, a teacher that I had only met once before. Um, also one of my greatest influences in life, uh, Michael Stewart from the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. Um, but I, I hadn't met and worked with him before. And I remember I got to my first lesson and I was so prepared. I thought, well, I know how to play violin. Like how much harder can viola be? And I played my concerto or something for him. And I remember we just started over and we just worked on scales from the beginning of the lesson. And I just realized that my eyes were open to how much can be accomplished on an instrument, not just viola itself, but it was through that lesson of playing scales of all things where I was just, I was so inspired to finally start really working hard and embracing the viola because it's such a beautiful sound and there were just I in that lesson playing scales there were sounds that I did not know you could produce on the viola and make such a beautiful sound out of and so and my teacher showed me all that so I think I started playing viola seriously when I was 13 and thankfully like a year after that I got my first viola and that's the one I still play on now so um it's been around for for a long time almost 10 years now so I really really love my instrument how did you find it? Um, the luthier that works on that or that has been working on my instrument ever since I was a child actually had it on his shelf um, in his shop once when I went to go, you know, get the violin tuned up and I had told him I'd be looking for a viola and he kind of pulls it off the shelf. It didn't have any varnish on it or anything. And he said, oh, this one is going to be a good one. And so when I came back the next year and I told him, okay, I'm looking to buy now, he had it already. And I tried that and a couple other ones, but I played on that one and that that was the one and i've always just been been really happy to play on it and it's a it's a bit of a smaller viola too so for me who has short arms and kind of small hands it's it's been perfect for me all these years so i really 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 like it so what would you say is the was the surprise what is the biggest difference in terms of just the technique is it i think um for viola that you get a little bit of a well, I don't want to say delay, but you definitely do have to work a little harder with the resistance of the strings and the bow on the strings. Um, and that's why my friends always give me such a bad time about it when one of them has their violin and I say, oh, can I try your violin for a second? And I, I'll pick it up and I'll say, oh, it feels, it feels a little bit easier than viola, which of course it's not true, but it's just, there's that slight, you know, switch, which is, oh, the, the strings on the viola just take that little bit more effort to kind of, um, and you kind of have to adapt how you're going to get the sound out without, you know, using too much energy, but it definitely definitely is a different approach of kind of a pulling the sound out of the instrument on the viola. Um, 
it's very slight play it's it's enough that you you gotta you gotta work on it a little bit mm -hmm. so obviously you were at Colburn you had you may be came down to San Diego from time to time maybe I don't know if you even knew the city what was there about San Diego that you were excited about well, for me, I remember actually that first day that I came down for the audition, I got off the train and I just remember thinking, I mean, it was just perfect weather that day, of course. And I got off the train. I just remember thinking that even in the city, the air was just cleaner, clearer. And I just really, really liked the atmosphere there in downtown. And unfortunately, I haven't gotten to see very much, but I think um, through the minimal experiences I did have there, and um, I did actually have a few opportunities to play as a substitute with the orchestra back in February, um, which is crazy to say, but almost a year ago, or yeah, a year ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, the, the welcoming atmosphere and the kind of family-like vibe of the orchestra was just, I, I, I'd never experienced something like that before. And so I felt very, very welcomed, um, even just as a substitute player. And I think the music making is, just it's incredible and it was a very very inspiring week that I spent there performing with the symphony so I'm just I'm so excited to jump back into it and start playing again I know it'll be a little different for a while but I'm I'm really really excited to start making music again do you remember the program that week I think it was the Shostakovich 11th mm -hmm. symphony I um, suspected that was the last week of February which was an incredible experience. It's a, it's a really, really impactful piece. So I'll remember that one for a long time. Yeah, I think we all will. Little did we know it was one of the last concerts we were here for a long time, but <laughs> I can, yeah. I've revisited that several times since the, those performances and it, it was really a remarkable weekend. Mm -hmm. So you're able to be home with family, able to be back in New Jersey during this time. Um, and it, is there any musical opportunities for you there? I kind of, I kind of have had to be creating them for myself, which I know is what a lot of musicians who are at home have to do. Um, but I've been so lucky that um, I'm able to, through, through the church community that uh, my family is a part of, I actually was able to put on a very small recital back in the fall. Um, it was, you know, there was no one there in the sanctuary except me and my mother who played the piano with me. And um, that was streamed to the members of the community. And um, I'm actually planning another one for the spring. So it's, they're small, but those are, those have been two of the highlights or, or examples of you know, kind of having to put put my name down for, I want to do this program then. And I think the members of the community really appreciate that too, because, you know, getting some live music and, and we're rotating with different members of the, um, of the community as well, who have done different, different programs and concerts with different instruments. And I think that has been very rewarding and just having the chance to share music, even on a very, very small scale without any audience members. Um, but it, it was very special when I did the concert in the fall. So I'm looking forward to in March. Um, I'm already thinking about what repertoire I'm going to be working on for that. And I'm really looking forward to it. And staying warm indoors, you just got a huge snowstorm out there. Oh, yeah. I think it actually is still coming down very gradually outside. But this is uh, day two of being snowed in. So, um, yeah, there's, there's going to be snow on the ground for, for a for a lot longer now. <laughs> well, enjoy it while it's there. It's something that you'll have to drive to find snow here. It can be done. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I find that the musical world is a small world. Uh, and, you know, you, uh, you were at Tanglewood for several summers, you, you know, LA area, et cetera. Do you know anybody else in our orchestra that you're looking forward to seeing? Oh, I mean, of course, uh, my friend Abraham, who is the other new violist, I'm really looking forward to uh, connecting with him again, because we were actually at Tanglewood, we overlapped at Tanglewood uh, the summer before last, and uh, we were, we weren't stand partners, but we were sitting on the stands right next to each other for uh, the Wagner opera, we did um, Die Valkyrie, 
uh, semi stage at Tanglewood, and so I remember we were we were kind of right right near each other there, and so that definitely is a a memory that we both bonded over. And then when we met at the audition, and then we both found out that we would both be moving. Um, so yeah, of course, of course, I'm I'm really looking forward, and um, I got to meet a good number of members of the symphony while I was there that week. So just looking forward to kind of reestablishing those relationships and forming new connections when I get there. We seem to have a number of Colburn graduates in the orchestra. So um, I'm sure no matter what, it will be a warm welcome. And Alexander is playing, I think, this week. I think <laughs> he's on the stage, if I heard correctly. Um, I think so, yeah. And the, you know, balancing your, the preparation for concerts and rehearsals, um, are, do you have other passions that kind of keep that going? What, other interests that you would look forward to pursuing in San Diego? Um, well, I guess when I get there, I kind of have to see what what doors are going to be open to me there. But I will say that right now, to balance alongside my musical interests, um, the two things that I have been kind of devoting myself to are, well, number one, I'm, I'm so lucky because I have a four month old niece that I've been babysitting um, three or four days every week except for this week because of the snow, I wasn't able to drive to get there. Um, but, you know, that has been just one of my passions, uh, just babysitting and spending time with kids. And I used to have a number of students when I was in high school, actually, really, really young students. Um, so that's definitely something I'm hoping someday I can teach younger kids again. And uh, another one of my passions is when I was younger, I had such a I, I, my hobby was uh, sketching and drawing and doing all kinds of art, the different mediums. And when I was in school, I didn't have any time to do that at all. It's like I took a five year break from any of that. And so when I came back to trying to, you know, sketch and create things again, um, after, you know, this past March, when I came, when I came home from California, I just thought, like, I, like I, haven't, like I haven't done this in five years. And of course, I hadn't practiced at all. But you know, I have to say I'm a little grateful for the extra time because not only was I able to work on, you know, viola without any stress or, you know, events coming up or performances I had to prepare for, but I had time to, you know, work on this other skill like my sketching. And actually, I have, I, I think I improved a little bit in the past couple of months. So that's something I'm looking forward to uh, kind of, I don't want to lose that again for another five years. So I'm going to try to keep that as a hobby, even when I'm there. Well, there's... Beautiful sketching to be done for sure. A, a lot of inspiration mm -hmm. in this incredible yeah, absolutely. landscape here. Uh, absolutely. So you, as you arrive, when you arrive, you'll let us know how we can best welcome you and support you. I know you're absolutely right about the orchestra. It has a very good um, and welcoming uh, culture and it, it lasts. I think people there take care of each other. It, it struck me when I came here as well. And, I think it's uh -huh. one of the great strengths of this orchestra, but we can't wait to see you. We'll be keeping you up to date as to when we think concerts are going to start again, but certainly we have a robust virtual uh -huh. um, uh, uh, upcoming. And so we'll, we'll be in touch with you. I think you have another piece that you recorded for us. Can you introduce that? Yes. Um, my last piece is the Max Rager solo viola suite. Um, and this is the third of three solo viola suites that he wrote. And this is my very favorite of the three. I think it's so beautiful. It has a very, uh, the first movement is a very um, kind of somber reflection movement. And then the second movement is this kind of crazy little dance. And I just really love the piece. So I hope you enjoy the piece. And thank you so much for having me here for this segment today. Um, it was a lot of fun. and. Uh, I'm so glad I got a chance to get to know you, Martha, and thank you, Jennifer, for everything and for arranging everything. Well, we're delighted to welcome you and can't wait to have you here in person. And thank I you for participating to today and for preparing the piece. Great. Thank you.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 